Hello and welcome to this episode which is going to be on John Locke's philosophy of language. I'm going to be doing a general series on philosophy of language and have basically decided that this is a good place to start. So without further ado, let's get into it. So in this episode, I suppose, what I'm going to cover is what is language? Um, then we're going to talk about meaning and signification for John Locke, uh, words and sentences, what do they mean? Um, and then we'll talk about some of the controversial parts of the Lockean theory, and then we'll talk about whether we should accept some of the less disputed assumptions in his theory. So first section, what is a language? So this is from an essay concerning human understanding, um, and I'm just going to read this because this will act as a basis for a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. Man, though he have a great variety of thoughts and such, and such from which others as well as himself might receive profit and delight, yet they are all within his own breast, invisible and hidden from others, nor can of themselves be made to appear, the comfort and advantage of society not being to be had without communication of thoughts, it was necessary that man should find out some external sensible signs, whereof those invisible ideas, which his known thoughts are made up of, might be made known to others. For this purpose, nothing was so fit, either for plenty or quickness, as those articulate sounds, which with so much ease and variety he found himself able to make. Thus we may conceive how words, which were by nature so well adapted to that purpose, came to be made made use of by men as the signs of their ideas, not by any natural connection that there is between particular articulate sounds and certain ideas, for then there would be but one language amongst all men, but by a voluntary imposition, whereby such a word is made arbitrarily the mark of such an idea. The use then of words is to be sensible marks of ideas, and the ideas they stand for are their proper and immediate signification. Um, and if you want to you know, read read more about this. That there's the selected reading in that book that I'm quoting from, that this screenshot's from. But um, an essay concerning human understanding is it, it's a pretty big book, but it's fairly readable and manageable, um, and probably worth getting into if you're interested in this sort of thing. So the general conception of language then that Locke has kind of put forward. Well. Many of the kind of ideas that are a part of Locke's theory of language can be found in Hobbes, who antedates him. And, um, you know, some of the kind of ideas that he's talking about go back as far as Plato and Aristotle, certainly found in um, Sophist. And, you know, if you, if you watch my videos on the history of logic, um, where I talk about some of the philosophy of language of the Stoics and the Aristotelian schools, well, you'll, you'll note that there are some kind of common themes that haven't gone away. Um, so there's a kind of continuous thread. But some of the the main points, as it were, that we're going to investigate that Locke seems to be concerned with, are uh, firstly that the nature of language is defined by its function. So what what language is is defined by what it does, um, and the function of language is to communicate. Um, and the, the what does it communicate? Well, the thing that language is meant to communicate is thought. Words themselves signify or mean the components of what language is meant to communicate. So. It, it, individual words um, stand for what what they mean um, are, the, are the components of the things that language is meant to communicate, and the components of of thought which is being communicated by language are ideas, like an individual idea, I suppose. So one person's ideas cannot be uh, another important part of this is going to be that one person's ideas can't be perceived by another. So ideas are themselves not public, but they're private. Um, and words themselves are not intrinsically meaningful, but rather they have their own meaning by convention or by um, conventional association that we we give to them. So we'll be investigating, you know, some of these claims and the plausibility of each um, in the more and less controversial sections that this is divided up into. So on the first point, the nature of language is defined by its function and the function of language is to communicate. So Locke says just before this, you know, God has created man as a social creature and furnished him with language to be a common tie of society. Man, therefore, had his organs so fashioned as to be able to, you know, do these things to communicate. And I mean, obviously, you know, whether or not you ac accept God's existence is, is going to play a, a kind of part in whether or not you ac accept this line of argumentation. But one of the reasons I think it's interesting is because Perhaps um, some people might hear Locke's kind of philosophy or theory of language and think, you know, that it's motivated by a kind of 
you know, it sounds quite materialistic or it sounds quite anti some of the metaphysical commitments that theists might like to have, but Locke himself is a committed theist and, you know, the, his whole conception of um, philosophy fits quite nicely with a theistic conception, at least as far as he's concerned. So Locke goes on to say, um, but just, well, this is this is me paraphrasing what Locke goes on to say, but just being able to make noises, you know, as, as our organs can, which God has given us, isn't enough for, you know, language proper. So parrots can articulate sounds, but they don't have a language. Now, again, that's going to be, you know, maybe contentious for a modern person. But, um, you know, as far as far as Locke's argumentation is concerned, you know, we, we're, we're sort of taking as our explanandum uh, human language and we're saying, you know, but but clearly what whatever it is that animals have isn't isn't the same as what we have. Okay, so the function of language then is is to communicate. That's what we have. Our, our, our kind of societies have, have been, uh, God has created us as creatures that live societally and we're supposed to communicate and language is the thing that fulfills that, that role for us. Okay, so language is meant to communicate thought and words signify or mean the components of what language is meant to communicate. So sounds must be the signs of internal conceptions. So, um, you know, when a parrot kind of learns learns to say, Polly want a cracker or whatever, this is sort of a purely behavioral thing, for according to Locke, that is. Um, you know, so, so it, it's a kind of insignificant noise in that the noise that the parrot's making doesn't signify a thought that the parrot has. Whereas, you know, in, in humans, at least on the on the Lockean theory, when we say sounds, we're, we're doing so to accompany a kind of mental state, a kind of thought that we have that we mean to express by, by the word. Um, so this is precisely the mechanism by which we're supposed to transmit our thoughts to other men. So, um, you know, me saying my sentences now, I've got a certain particular meaning in mind, a certain set of thoughts, and I'm trying to communicate them to you by the use of my my sounds and noises and trying to induce in you the same thoughts. Okay, so we're going to talk about meaning and signification then. So what do words mean? Well, according to Locke, ideas are representations of things. So, um, you know, those, those who are familiar with um, Locke's epistemology will know that he's a kind of in, indirect realist. So there, there's kind of primary and secondary qualities of things, you know, that, that distinction goes back to Locke. But as, as far as we're concerned, there is, there is an external world, you know, comprised of, um, well, what I can see in front of me right now, a candle, a set of keys, uh, a mobile phone. And my ideas of those things are representations of those things in the actual world. So when I use a word, I'm using it to signify that idea. Um, so that's what a word on first sight, that's what a word means. It signifies the idea, but the idea signifies a thing in the world. So it's sort of by that root that the word itself signifies the, the thing in the world, rather than it kind of directly reflecting that thing in the world. Um, so one criticism has been that, you know, Locke, Locke seems to sort of think that words, okay, words signify ideas, but signify is not quite the same as mean. Is it is it fair to say that Locke thinks that word means that that words mean ideas? So um, Michael Morris in his book, which I'm kind of drawing on for for this, it uh, sort of suggests the notion of signification is loose enough to allow that a word like gold, for example. Uh, expresses gold by means of a concept or idea which represents gold. So it's not, you know, it, it, it's not really inappropriate to say means instead of uh, signifies, or to, it, it's not inappropriate, sorry, to use those two interchangeably to say words mean ideas rather than words signify. They're, they're basically the same. Okay, so words and sentences. Words are the basic components of language. So the basic meanings of words must be the basic components of what is meant by language. So, so think. Of, I, I mean, maybe I should introduce this in a, in a different video. The the term semantics, but semantics is broadly going to be something to do with what what words mean. So when we think about um, our sentences, you know, sentences are composed of words. Um, sentences express you know, a, a kind of whole meaning, right? And the component of, of that whole meaning of an expression is sort of determined by the meaning of those individual sort of atomic parts that can comprise them. 
So, you know, what's motivating this? Why should we think that words are ba basic? Well, so far as meaning is concerned, they're the smallest meaningful atom. Um, so obviously that means that we're, we're supposing that there's no dependence of the meaning of a word on its letters. Um, so that, you know, that might be a contentious assumption, but it, nevertheless, it's part of the Lockean theory that a word is the smallest atom of meaning. And, you know, so think of the word word, as it were, in quotes, um, you know, that for, for Locke, then word means something, but the meaning of word isn't determined by what or, 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 you know, those those noises taken individually. Um and so that that also means that we're going to have to consider words like unhappy or toothpick as two words, you know, where un, the, the prefix of happy, is a sort of separate word, right? Um, because clearly that that does contribute something to the meaning. And, and in toothpick, for example, tooth and pick are going to have to be two words as well. Um, okay, so are words dependent on letters for their meaning? You know, so, so are, are individual words dependent on the letters that comprise them for their meaning? Um, this is to doubt whether words are arbitrary signs, and we'll come back to this in some criticisms a little later on. So let's talk about some controversial parts of the Lockean theory then. So firstly, um, as we've said, the function of a language is to communicate, but Locke's theory makes communication impossible because genuine communication requires understanding one another. You know, it means that whatever I have in mind I get that across into your mind um, by means of communicating using language. So knowing what someone means for Locke means knowing what ideas are associated with what words for her. Okay, so if I'm listening to, to you telling me something, you're telling me the cat is on the mat. For me to know what you mean by uttering that sentence, I have to know what the relationship is between the noises that you're using and the ideas that you have in mind. But I don't have access to your ideas because your ideas are private for you. Um, so the only way that I could know which ideas are signified by your words would either be, you know, if I had access to your ideas, which I don't, so I could see the relation between your ideas and the words that you're using, um, or if there was some dependable relation, you know, some kind of like necessary connection where a word has to mean a particular thing between words and particular ideas. Um, so it, put it, putting all of this together then, it means that I can't be sure that I know what you mean. Um, and then language can't actually fulfill its function for Locke, which is to communicate. A second controversial problem with Locke's theory of language is gonna be the unity of the proposition. So um, we're gonna kind of use sentences, you know, sentences express propositions, but we're gonna use sentences and propositions loosely as interchangeable here. Um, Sentences aren't just lists of word, words. Um, sentences express some overall meaning. So if we look at the di difference between one and two here, and we'll come back to this problem when we come on to Frege. Um, so in one, red rum is a horse, right? So we're predicating of red rum as a name that red rum is a horse. Whereas um, the in two, the list of words doesn't mean the same thing as one. Red rum being, obviously in, in the first sentence, is as a copula, is a verb. Um, it's the verb of being a horse, right? So if we if we replace that with the with the noun being, right? Or uh, sorry, with the verb being, um, and then the noun, the concept horse. Well, red rum being the concept horse, sort of um, you know, the it's just a list. It doesn't mean a whole proposition. So the unity of the proposition is something that sentences have, but lists of words do not. Um, and this is quite hard to explain unless you presuppose that words are suited for particular grammatical roles, words having a grammar built into them. Now, for Locke, though, where ever you know the the kind of atom of meaning. Um, is a word which stands for a particular idea. It's kind of hard to see how you how you get this because each each individual word is is just kind of denoting an idea. So how do they fit together as it were to create a unified expression? So that's a problem for the Lockean theory. Okay, so there are some of the other things that we've introduced are, are less disputed assumptions um, of the Lockean theory today, and we're going to sort of assess them and see how they stand up to some scrutiny. So um, 
two of our less disputed assumptions from the original uh, introductory slide were the nature of language is defined by its function and the function of a language is to communicate. So both one and two notably assume that language has only one function, you know, by its function, it's being singular there. And two, you know, the function of a language is to communicate, so to communicate and nothing else, right? But if we consider language or explanandum, actually there's a bunch more data that we should be taking into account there and explaining. So think of a good poem, for example, you know, what, what does that do? What does that communicate? Um, think of someone telling a joke. Is that is that, I mean, maybe it's communicating information in certain senses of information, but it's not obviously apparent that someone is communicating something to someone else there. And, um, you know, think of um, a vicar or an imam or a humanist cleric or whatever saying, I hereby pronounce you husband and wife. You know, what have they, I mean, in one sense, maybe they've communicated something that um, the couple is now married. In another, have they really communicated anything or is it fulfilling you know, a kind of ceremonial function, is that is that different? So um, it's not obvious that two is true either in, in Locke's theory. But these are generally taken to be to be less disputed, but they, they can be disputed on these grounds. Um, and then if we look at these um, other assumptions that were included in the original slide, the relation between words and what they signify or mean is arbitrary or conventional. Um, and then, relatedly, words are not intrinsically meaningful. So whatever one word means could have been meant by another word. That, that's what um, seven is to say. The relation between words and what they signify or mean is arbitrary. Is Whatever one word means could have been meant by another word. So, um, you know, there could be a community of speakers where... Um, cat means dog and dog means cat, you know, the noise, the the symbols that are used when they're written down are just completely interchanged. But the the meanings, um, obviously, they, they know what they mean by it. They have a word for cats, they have a word for dogs in my context of utterance. But, uh, you know, it's in the, the symbol or the sound is inverted for them. Um, so what is meant by a, wo a word here, you know, is, is pronounced my, my notes aren't particularly clear on the slide, right? But um, So in that first sentence where I've said, whatever one word means could have been meant by another word is what um, Seven is saying. Well, what's meant by a word here? You know, the relation between words and what they signify is arbitrary. Well, by word, we mean pronunciation and spelling um, are irrelevant to meaning. Okay, so are pronunciation and spelling irrelevant to meaning? Well, think of something like a poem. All of the things are relevant to the meaning, um, all kinds of things are relevant to the meaning of the whole poem. So, you know, the rhythm, the rhyme, syllables, and so forth. Poems will um, play on the number of syllables that there are in words. They'll rhyme couplets and things together at the end. Um, you know, a, a lot of Shakespeare's um, plays and, and so forth are, are supposed to be read in iambic pentameter, which emphasizes particular sy syllables. And these things are part of the overall meaning um, of what the the poem or play is is supposed to mean. And we can even think of, you know, other languages such as maybe um, African or Amazonian tribal languages, which, you know, dep depend on um, certain cliques or onomatopoeia, which we'll talk about in a second, um, to mean certain things. So if you accept seven, then you have to consider these kinds of consider. You have to consider these considerations. You have to consider these kinds of things irrelevant to the meaning of something like a poem. Um, and then we consider eight words are not intrinsically meaningful. Well, eight says words are just types of sound or mark, but that goes beyond what's really required um, for seven. So seven could be true, right? But words would still be intrinsically meaningful in some way. So consider cases of onomatopoeia like, um, you know, bang or uh, and what bang means. Or um, in English where we say frogs mean ribbit or in Spanish where they say they mean croc, right? You don't particularly have to know English or Spanish to know that when someone says the word ribbit or croc that they're referring to, you know, something like those little green things that hang around ponds and stuff and make make those kinds of noises or, or the noises that they make. Um, 
Okay, so that is the end of the introduction to locks theory. So I should have probably put in a summary slide, um, but we'll go back to the start then to cover what we've looked at. So we we considered kind of lo locks general theory, which is that the moving parts, as it were, are words or written symbols. Um, and then there's ideas, which are these private psychological things. You know, ideas aren't some kind of um, uh, Fragian thought or Platonic thought or objective reality. It's just a private psychological thing. And words are associated to an idea by a speaker. And um, what someone does in trying in, in uttering language and trying to communicate with someone else is to let them know what what the thoughts that they're having are. Um, we looked at all of the kind of assumptions that this breaks down into. So the nature of language is defined by its function. The function of a language is to communicate. Language is meant to communicate thought. Words signify or mean the components of what language is meant to communicate. The components of thought or ideas. One person's ideas cannot be perceived by another and words are not intrinsically meaningful. And we sort of assess some of these by, you know, those which are more controversial, those which are less controversial. So that brings us loosely and quickly over um, Locke's theory of language. Some resources, if you want to check out some more of this, would be um, an essay concerning understanding, which I, I got the excerpt from uh, Aloysius Martinovich's The Philosophy of Language. Um, so that's just a bunch of readings on philosophy of language, if you're interested. Um, and a lot of the details as well in this are pulled out of an introduction to the philosophy of language by Michael Morris. So that's another good book that you may want to check out if you're interested in pursuing this further. Um, so very short and brief. And basically in this series, I, uh, my plan is to make um, a few of these of similar length. So in the next one, I think we'll probably look at John Stuart Mill's theory, which is um, which reacts a little bit against the Hobbesian um, theory of language, which is a part of Locke's theory of language, and you know we'll, we'll just we'll just continue building on in each one. So I hope to see you there. Um, also, thank you to my patrons for supporting me, what I do, and the channel. Um, if you would like to support me, then you can go to patron.com/digitalgnosis. And um, the lowest tier is three pounds a month, so a cup of coffee or something. And if you appreciate um, the kind of stuff that I produce and you want to help support me and the channel and, you know, some of the minor costs and stuff involved of running the channel, which is primarily what funding goes towards, then um, I really appreciate that. So thank you. And thanks to all those on screen who are current supporters. Right. Well, I hope it's been useful for those listening and I'll see you next time.